to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn, and I'm here today with Susie Stiles to talk about how the sounds of language might be connected to other sensations that you have. Welcome, Susie. Hi, it's great to be here. It's so exciting to have you on the podcast. I should just like say straight up, we are doing some research together which we're going to talk about during the show. Mm. Um, And I always have such a great time chatting to you every time that we're working that I wanted to share that, as we often like to do in Lingthusiasm, share the chats that we enjoy having so much um, with everyone else. It's super exciting to be here. I'm delighted. I enjoy your podcast very much and also our chats together. So it's great to combine the two. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. One thing we always like to ask people straight up is, how did you get into linguistics? Mm, uh, it's a bit of an interesting one. I think when I was a small child, I was very much interested in language and words and, and thought about being a writer, uh, but didn't really see how that was working with my interest in science. So I was sort of pursuing physics and chemistry and literature at the same time, and I couldn't sort of square the two away together. And when I was getting towards the end of high school, I went and took on a research project where I went and worked with a particle accelerator for a month. That is cool. Uh, so I was doing sort of nuclear physics of electron spin and all sorts of things like this. And I realized that I was deeply uninterested in the practical aspects of doing <laughs> physics experiments <laughs> and ran screaming to the humanities where on arriving at the ANU, the Australian National University, I discovered this class that was this like scientific approach to the language stuff that I'd always found delightful. So introduction to linguistics. And I just fell in love. I, I, I haven't left since. So that was my grand introduction. It was the language stuff and the people stuff that I'd always found fascinating, but also a more scientific approach to the logic of the stuff that I loved. So was there a a week in that class or was it literally week one where you were like, this is where I need to be? I read the prospectus and I was hooked. (laughs) (laughs) That's doubly impressive. (laughs) And your day job, you Mm. work at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore Mm -hmm. in the psychology department. Yes. So how did you get from studying undergraduate linguistics to ending up in a psych department? So I made the transition from classical and formal linguistics, where I was interested in the history of words, to psycholinguistics after a long and detailed research project on the way that people used to use prepositions to talk about time in the Middle Ages in English. Uh, And I was very interested in seeing if I could see how the meanings of those words changed over time. But realized that when I was working with these old languages, there were these gaps between one text and the next that were sometimes 600 years long. Um, And that what I was missing was the transition from one person to another. And that's where meaning change, I think, really, really happens when one community is shifting slightly in this small time scale. And so obviously, the only way to study this was to work with babies who are learning their words for the first time. So the transition happened when I moved across to the University of Oxford to work in the Oxford Baby Lab, Mm -hmm. where we were investigating all sorts of things to do with how babies learn their words for the first time. Not growing babies, studying babies. Yes, we were investigating the way that living babies who would come into the lab for a visit Uh would process the sounds of speech and how they were connecting up the meanings of different words together. Cool. What was it like going from studying medieval manuscripts to actual real-life tiny humans? It's a bit of an adjustment. (laughs) Uh, it was fabulous. Uh, again, it was moving from a more theoretical to a more people-oriented practice, which I sort of see coming back again and again in my work. Every time I get hyper-theoretical, I come back to people and I find them far more interesting. So what were you studying the babies for mm. in Oxford? So uh, this was my PhD research. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I was working on was how babies connect up the different items in their growing lexicon. So when a baby learns one or 10 or 20 different words, what we're curious about is when they start to have in the organization of their lexicon, when they start to organize those words according to what they mean or how they go together. So we could imagine one child is learning a word like cat and a word like table and a word like dog. Yeah. 
And for most adults, the word cat and dog go together in a way that cat and table do not. But similarly, if the same child is learning cat and table and car, the yeah. cat and the car share something that they don't share with the table. So there's a, a sound-based relationship and a meaning-based relationship. So we were working on a method called priming yeah. where – what we're able to do is see whether children can understand the meaning of one word slightly more quickly if they've just heard another word that's related to that one. Okay. How would you prime me if I was a, an infant learning? So what I might do is I might give you a picture-finding task. Okay. So I'm going to put on the screen in front of you uh -huh. a picture of a cat mm -hmm. and a boat. Right. And your job is going to be to find the cat. Mm -hmm. And so before I say the word cat, I give you just some language that's completely unrelated to the task. So okay. it might go something like this. Yesterday, I saw a dog cat and then the pictures appear. Oh, okay. That was very sudden. I was just sitting here looking at a screen and suddenly there's dogs and cats and... Yeah. Uh, so what we found in those studies is between the age of one and a half and mm -hmm. two years of age... Yeah. Children get faster at finding the named picture if it was preceded by a word that's related to it. Okay. Compared to if we had a different condition where we said, yesterday, I ate an apple cat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was, so, that, that, uh, talking about eating an apple does not prime me to think about cats at all. Right. Yeah. So we found very reliable evidence, and, and this effect has been replicated a couple of different times in a couple of different age groups, and the method of priming in early childhood is now being used for all sorts of different aspects of the way that children connect up their lexicons. Okay. So mm -hmm. learning words mm -hmm. is a complicated task, and we sometimes draw on meaning, and we sometimes draw a bit on sound as mm -hmm. well. So. Yeah, but it's interesting that at the very early stages of development, we see the same organizational properties for how those words work together as we see in adults. So the structure is there right from the start, and that's yeah. really exciting. I think it's worth like always making clear in these things, right, that it's your the kids are hearing these sentences long before they can clearly say, yesterday I saw a cat. Mm. You know, they're probably not saying it quite mm -hmm. that sophisticatedly. <laughs> But they're able yeah. to, like, being able to comprehend things always outstrips production yes. with these things. Mm. And for our one-and-a-half-year-olds, it was clear that although they understood almost all of the words in the test, they were saying very few of them at that stage. And yet we were still seeing this evidence from the way that they moved their eyes while they were looking for these pictures yeah. that – even in comprehension, the connections between the words were doing some of the heavy lifting for them, not just one word on its own. Right. I'm always torn between being like, oh, my gosh, kids are so clever and, oh, my gosh, they're so stupid. Like, <laughs> they can't even say a whole sentence yet. Mm. But uh, it is pretty, pretty impressive. And so you use gaze tracking mm. to test those. Yeah, this was um, still in the old days where the only way to do gaze tracking was realistically to record the children's eye movements using a video camera and then go through an exquisitely laborious process of coding the videos one frame at a time. Okay, mm -hmm. but now we have eye tracking that's like a machine you can use that does mm. it all for you right yeah so the latest wave of uh eye trackers are exciting pieces of equipment that use a small infrared light and they look like a very uh an ordinary computer monitor except at the bottom there's a strip that contains a couple of cameras and some little infrared lights that flash and what they do is they flash their little light onto the baby's eyes Oh. And you can track the reflection of that light to figure out where the baby is looking at any point in time. That is very clever. Mm. Mm. And a lot easier to work with. Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> it speeds up the process enormously. Fabulous. Mm. Um, and so from there, so we went with words and what they mean. Mm. But that's not quite what you're working on at the moment. Mm. So where did we go from there? So I guess one of the things that I was very aware of in um, Oxford was that the vast majority of babies that lived in our region were English-only babies. 
Right. And while people who are listening to this podcast might come from communities where that's the norm, uh, when we look at the whole globe at once, the majority of babies grow up with more than one language in their household mm -hmm. and probably several. Yeah. So being monolingual is actually a bit abnormal. Uh, and we sometimes use the acronym WEIRD to describe this, where the, the letters all stand for something. So most of the evidence about most of the languages that have ever been investigated comes from countries that are Western, mm -hmm. educated, mm -hmm. industrialized, okay. rich, and the D stands for democratic. Uh, <laughs> but I think mainly to make the word nice. Weird, yeah. <laughs> so when we talk about weirds, what we mean is that everything we think we know about how humans operate is usually biased by this small subsample of languages and, and research contexts. Yeah. Which, like, I, w I think I probably learned this acronym from you because coming from a language documentation perspective, hmm. very few of my immediate colleagues and people who trained me work with English speakers or mm. work in kind of this weird paradigm. And mm. so uh, and we'll talk about the work we did in a minute. But when I came to you, I was like, well, obviously I'm going to do it with this group of people in Nepal who I work with. And you were like, well, oh, that's, that's not very usual to get to do this kind of um, mm. psychology work. And I was just like, well, who, who else am I going to like? <laughs> Obviously, I have a question about this group of people, and mm. I just thought it was normal that you would ask research questions about not just English mm. speakers, but apparently it's a, it's a kind of thing people are trying to get the hang of. Yeah, I think it's mainly for people who work in psycholinguistics, it's an access problem. Right. So because the equipment that we use and the laboratory settings that we use are often very like tightly controlled, yeah. the people that we work with are the people who live in the nearby environment who can pop in for a visit, <laughs> uh, which is not really going to be the same as linguistic field work where you go out to where people speak a different language. Yeah. So in my transition between these worlds, um, when I was looking at the, the groups of people who lived around Oxford, there were lots of people who were growing up in bilingual households, but each bi or multilingual household was unique and different from the ones around it. And I saw this fabulous opportunity to look at what was going on in Singapore, mm -hmm. which is a country that has four official languages and more varieties of language that are spoken in the home. And it's perfectly normal for the vast majority of the population to be growing up in a family that is many generations multilingual. Everywhere around you, you never forget that there are other languages. Mm. Like all of the information on the train is in the four official languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's always other things. There's like lots of TV channels that aren't just in English. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just a normal part of life and you are weird if you're a monolingual. Mm. Yeah. So making the transition over towards Singapore, I was asking myself these questions about what are the things we don't yet know about the process of being bi or multilingual. And there are a few labs that are investigating the development of babies in bi and multilingual communities. Most of the work that's currently being done tends to be in very early childhood, focusing on the way that babies' hearing develops in line with the languages that they hear around them when they're very young. And we've talked about that in a couple of episodes. We introduced people to the very sophisticated, uh, actually very serious uh, methodology of high amplitude sucking mm, um, mm. in an earlier episode. And uh, we've talked a little bit about it with, with vowels as well, how people acquire well before they're even aware that their brain is doing this, the kind of sound set that their language has. Mm. So I guess what I was interested is thinking beyond just the sound system on its own and asking myself this question of whether the sound system changes cause other changes as well. So what I mean by that is um, if children over the second half of their first year of life change the way that their brain is representing acoustic information so that it forms up neatly into categories that are aligned with the adults from their speech community. Mm -hmm. If that change is going on at a very deep level in auditory cortex, mm -hmm. then maybe the way they process other sensations is also influenced by the way that their hearing is changing. Right. 
So we have the brain kind of going, these are the sounds you've been hearing, these are the sounds in the language, kind of remolding itself to fit that. Mm-hmm. And then there is some relationship between how humans think about the sounds that they hear and, and kind of other senses mm. that could vary because that brain reorganizing. Mm. So I'm very interested in the idea of multisensory processing. Uh, and this is the idea that when we hear some sounds in the world, they kind of go better with some visual kinds of information than others, or they go better with some objects in the world than others. And we know this and we learn this as children. Um, at, at a very deep level, these relationships exist in the world outside us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and where we can be aware of those kinds of relationships. So, um, would you like me to give you an example? Okay. Okay. So, um, if I ask our listeners to imagine for a moment that I'm holding in my hand a staple and I'm going to drop it on a hard table, I think all of us can imagine the kind of noise that that staple is going to make when it makes contact with the table. Mm -hmm. So to describe its acoustic features, it's going to be a high frequency sound. Uh, So it's going to have high pitch elements. It's going to be quite quiet and it's going to be quite short lasting. So something like that. Mm-hmm. Now, if you imagine that I drop the stapler, <laughs> you can already... That's going to make a very different sound. Yeah, it's going to make yeah. a very different sound. I might come and ask what you're doing with my stapler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the properties that are going to be different here, are there are going to be more low frequency elements in the sound. It's going to be lower pitched. Mm-hmm. It's going to be louder and it's yes. going to be a longer lasting sound. hmm So what we've got already is this idea that for objects in the world that are small, the sounds that go along with them are going to be high frequency, quiet, and short-lasting. Okay. Like a small dog is going to yap and a big dog is going to bark. Yeah. That kind of perception that we have. Yeah. And if we extend that uh, even wider in the animal kingdom, we can think about elephants and mosquitoes. That is a lot wider, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the mosquitoes going to make... Imagine a world in which mosquitoes made the noise of elephants and the <laughs> elephants made the noise of mosquitoes. That would be amazing. Right, and we can make actually a, a very clean prediction about this. If we grew up in a world where that were the case, we would expect babies to learn that really, really early on. Because mm-hmm, you'd want to stay out of the way of those high buzzing elephants. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and in fact, there's there's a very good evolutionary story that suggests that if a brain can make these connections or is possibly even born with these connections, then it has a higher chance of surviving in the world. Right. Uh, even frogs seem to know about this kind of relationship. Is that why they all pretend to be bigger, by having really big voices? Yeah, it seems that lady frogs find that very appealing right. in a gentleman frog. So gentlemen frogs have figured out the game. <laughs> Yeah. So once we know about this relationship and we know that that hearing is connected to vision in a way that makes sense in the world, when we think about the baby side and we know that babies are learning about the sound patterns in their world, Uh if the sound pattern in one language is different from another, maybe it influences the way that the sounds are connected to other sensory pieces of information. Okay. So this is kind of getting into the idea that Because in linguistics, we spend a lot of time teaching adults, undergraduates, whoever, but we teach people that words are arbitrary is the the fancy terminology we use. But like, there's no reason why dog should be dog. It could be any other combination of sounds. It is other combinations of sounds in all the world's languages. Mm. But what you're saying is because we inevitably can never separate language from the physical world in which we speak it, Mm. perhaps that is not as entirely arbitrary as all that, that there might be some patterns happening. Mm. So, yeah, at the very most basic level, there's an idea that some sounds in language might go better with some meanings or some other sensory experiences in okay. the world. Yeah. So the, the classic test for this is known as the Booba Kiki test. Should we do the test? Yeah, let's okay. do the test. Excellent. It's time for some podcast experimenting. Get your lab <laughs> coats on, people. You're going to do some science. Fantastic. 
Uh, so what I would like our listeners to do today mm -hmm. is, first of all, to imagine in their mind a shape that is really angular and pointy around the edges. Mm -hmm. So a nice sharp shape. And I'm, now I'm going to describe a second shape. And this shape is going to be very curvy and rounded around the edges. If you have no imagination, we'll have pictures of both of these images in the show notes. You can go look at those while you're hearing about them and deciding what. So what do we do next with these two shapes? Okay, so we've got two shapes in mind, and now I'm going to introduce you to two names for these shapes. Okay. And each of you individually can just make up your own mind which label you think is a better name for which of the shapes. Okay. So we've got two shapes, one spiky one, one curvy one. And I'm going to name my shapes. Yes. So, the first name is Maluma. The second name is Takete. Okay, I'm going to tell you what name I gave to each of my shapes, and you can decide if your description matches or if it doesn't. So, our blobby, roundy thing, that's called Maluma. And our spiky thing, that's called takete. Is and that's the way they feel for you. Is that's that... how they feel for me. That makes sense, in some way. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this uh... is to totally spontaneous response here. I have not done this test a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps our listeners could uh, tell us via Twitter whether or not their <laughs> sensory perceptions agreed. Yeah. If you if you disagree, I mean, if you agreed with me, please let me know for validation. <laughs> um, if you didn't agree, you can also let us know. We can also put it in as a little Twitter quiz. Oh yeah, to go we'll, alongside. we'll run a Twitter quiz. That'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. Um, so the answer that Lauren has just given us is the answer that ninety percent of people give when they're given this task. Ninety percent. This is one of the strongest effects that has ever been documented in the field of psychology, huh. or possibly linguistics. <laughs> <laughs> where almost everyone agrees on the same direction of the match. Uh, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, this effect has been known for almost 100 years, and it's been replicated many, many times and in lots of different languages and in lots of different contexts. So this booba kiki effect, as it's now known, is considered to be something that is universal. Except we broke it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is the point where we get to ask this this uh, fabulous question that says, if the sounds that we learn as children are different from each other, do effects like the booba kiki effect really apply? Or were all of those replications over nearly 100 years, were they all biased by being tested on weird populations, not non-weird so ones? So I heard you talking about this stuff in, I don't even think it was in a seminar. I think we were just out to lunch with people and you were telling them how you were looking at Booba and Kiki, starting to look at it in children, but you were also looking at um, how it relates to Mandarin tone. And we'll talk mm. about that. I kind of came to you and said, I, I'm working with this other tone language called Shuba in Nepal. It's got Tibetan tone. There's two tones. And I think people have a different idea about what's a high tone and what's a low tone to how I conceptualize it. And that's how we hit upon doing this study together, looking at the relationship between tone and other senses. But we had to do a Kiki Booba first just to check because it's universal. We wanted to make sure that our participants were doing what everyone else did. And then I kind of I wrote to you after we ran the experiment in Nepal and I was like, it, it didn't work. I, th I thought it was meant to be, this is meant to be the easy part of the experiment. Mm. And um, something went wrong. Mm. It was deeply mysterious. Uh, everything in the literature on this effect shows that it's highly replicable. It keeps happening over and over again. And it seemed at the time not to matter what language you went to. Everyone showed the same effect. So we went back and looked at the literature and thought, is there anything we've missed? And there was one paper. <laughs> Just one, a glorious paper from 1975. It's that like was, one page long, right? Yeah, it's only about 350 words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and it was another 
uh, fieldwork study with a group of people living in a remote community, this time in Papua New Guinea rather yep. than Nepal, which is where, Lauren, you went to. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so we, we tried to figure out whether there was anything that was similar about what we'd done in Nepal and what uh, this other paper from 1975 had shown in Papua New Guinea. So we sort of scratched our heads a bit and tried to figure it out. And then, Lauren, I think it was your analysis of the words we'd put together yeah. that helped us solve the problem. So we used kiki and boo-boo as, like, close enough because there's not that o u o kind of sound in the language. And I said, you know, these are perfectly fine and I could get someone to say them, but they're not good words in the language. Like, these sounds all exist, but you wouldn't have this k kiki sound in the middle of a word. Mm. And the tone doesn't quite work like that. Tone kind of works a bit differently to how it was structured to make the words sound like kiki and boo-boo. And we realised that even though we tried to make it exactly the same words as the other versions of the test, mm. that had actually been the problem is that these weren't words in the language. And from what we can tell, people were so, like, mystified by this weird sound. It would be like giving English speakers, like, moo as a word. You'd be like, oh, I kind of – sounds a bit like a word, but not a very good one. And it kind of breaks your ability to do this – kiki booba to shape thing. Mm. So, yeah, we, we suddenly come across this idea that if the combination of sounds that you stick together is not really wordy. That's the very scientific term we used in the paper. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, word wordiness, I yes. believe we called it. <laughs> yeah. So if your sound set of sounds together is not really wordy, then you lose the ability to do all of those things that we normally do with words. So it makes it harder for us to learn words and it, make, it makes it harder for us to remember what we've just heard. And it seems in this case, it makes it harder for us to connect the sounds in that word to some other sensation as well. And that's what happened as well in the Sonja language, which was the other language from PNG with that other failure, is that mm. they didn't have a T sound in the language. So mm -hmm. they didn't have that T, so they couldn't even say, they used Takete for theirs. Takete and Maluma, and, yeah. yeah. And so like Takete, the, that T wasn't even a sound. And they also the didn't have the L sound in yeah. Maluma. So... When we went back to the 1975 paper and we double-checked and we double-checked and we found out that they had also used non-wordy words in their test. Yeah. So suddenly there are these two failures in the literature and both of them had non-wordy words. So what this suggested to us was when we go through that process of learning how our language sounds, the way that the brain adapts to the sound structure of the language kind of overflows outside of just listening for understanding into everything we do with those sounds. I have never been more excited to fail in my life. It was so <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, actually, it was, it was very exciting. So I hadn't realised that it was weird to work with non-weird people. I hadn't realised, well, I don't think either of us realised that you could break the Kiki Buba Maluma Takete thing. Mm. And I hadn't realized that it was weird to suggest that we do this work on a language with tone because you were doing some work on Mandarin. But that's some of the mm. first work that's looked at this cross sensory effect. And again, it's just because we're like, well, English speakers will start with English and not think about the fact that many languages have tone to mark the difference between words. Mm. Are your listeners particularly familiar with tone languages and no, how they work? Let's do a very quick tone 101. Tone 101. So the idea is that different languages pay attention to different properties of the way noises sound. So some languages in the world, when you change the pitch of your voice, it can signal a fundamentally different word meaning. So to give an example from Chinese, yep. if we say a syllable like m a joined up together but with a different kind of pitch contour, it can mean something different. So I'll give you a little example. Okay. If I say ma, it's a very common word that you would use to refer to your mother. Okay. If I say ma, it means horse. 
So in this example, what we can see is that the consonant and the vowel are the same for for those utterances, mm-hmm. but the way the voice changes in pitch signals a difference in word meaning. And this is a bit different from languages like English. Yeah. Mm. So what we know from uh, decades of people trying to teach Westerners how to speak Chinese is that people who don't speak languages with tone have difficulty catching on to the pitch property of the words that they're hearing and remembering it long enough to learn the meaning of it. I can never remember in, you know, there's only two, there's high and low in Shuba, and I never remember or rarely remember which one it should be. Yeah. So there seems to be something fundamentally different about the way that brains of English speakers process pitch compared to the brains of Mandarin speakers who've grown up in a language that uses this property. So what we wanted to know in some of our other studies is whether or not the perceptual tuning to audio that has gone on for Mandarin speakers also changes the cross-modal connection between hearing and vision. Right. Mm. So we've been running a bunch of studies with my uh, former PhD student, Shang Nan, where what we've been doing is asking people who speak different combinations of languages to make some judgments of the buba kiki kind, yeah. but listening to, instead of whole long words like maluma and takete, they're just listening to very short single syllable names. So they might be hearing e or e or e or e. And I'm not going to lie, like the First thing I think of when I hear all four, four of those is E. <laughs> like, that's all I take away. Right. Uh, so then we also asked them the same questions for the oo sounds. So we had oo and oo and oo and oo. And you'll be unsurprised to know that what I take away from that is oo. <laughs> like, with any intonation. Yeah. Uh, and we found this quite a lot, actually. Um, our English speaking participants struggled to really hear the difference between the, the different sounds. But, you know, they could always make a choice depending on whether it was an eat sound or an oot sound. Yep. So we showed them a kiki type shape and a booba type shape uh, and had our people make their choices. And overall, everybody preferred the eat noises to go with the spiky ones mm-hmm. and the oot noises to go with the blobby ones. Okay, so that still works. But on top of that, there was a, a tendency for the people who grew up in Mandarin Chinese to really, really like to match the high, steady tone like ooh with the blobby shape. Okay. Whereas our English speakers liked to match the high tone E with the spiky one. Yep, that gels with my personal feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so so what we were finding then was that the English speakers were paying attention to the high frequency elements, the high pitch of the voice in E and saying that's a spiky thing, just like the staple is a high frequency noise and just like the K sound in kiki is a high frequency noise. That that all goes together to make a package that says high frequency should be spiky. Our Mandarin speakers were paying attention to pitch in a completely different way. They were paying attention to how much the pitch changed. Ah. So when they hear a sound like it's like nice and smooth and stable <laughs> and steady, or at least this is what my PhD student, who is a native speaker of Mandarin Chinese, tells me. Right. <laughs> we'll trust her. Uh, whereas when they heard a sound like, ooh, they were finding that a very dramatic sound because it becomes loud and then quiet very, very quickly, and the pitch changes a lot. So that was a very spiky sound for our Mandarin speakers. So here what we see is is this intriguing case where when we listen to just one feature of a sound, whether the pitch is high or whether it's changing or whether it's high or whether it's low, two groups of speakers make exactly opposite decisions for which one should go with which. Right. And it seems to be driven by the way that their brain processes these sounds differently. Hmm. Awesome. 
We are currently writing up what happened with Schubertone, which is very exciting, and uh, I will, I mean, I'll blog about it. And you, of course, run a lab in Singapore. Mm. I'm sure you'll also share it on the Blip Lab uh, website. Yes, which stands for Brain Language Intersensory Processing. Yes, indeed. So the Blip Lab in Singapore. Uh, we have a little Facebook page and we have a website as well. Uh, and we also tweet. And about from time to our time, findings. you have really great online experiments that people can do. Mm. Be sure to share those when they come up. Yes. If there's one thing you could leave people thinking about linguistics, what would it be? So when we learn and think about that way that language works, there's so much interesting and fabulous stuff going on that we often have this tendency to think about language in isolation mm -hmm. and to think about the way that it works internally and how separate it is from everything else that we do or feel or experience. And the one thing I want to leave people with is how deeply embedded our language processing system is in our bodies and how it's connected to the way that we process the information that's coming in through our senses. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo, and Gretchen can be found at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and her blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistics questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate if you can rate us on iTunes, or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire, and our editorial producer is Emily. All our music is by The Triangles. I'll leave you with Susie Siles. Stay Lingthusiastic! <laughs>